Hi guys and welcome back. In this video we're going to talk about how SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, can cause weight loss and what you should do if you want to treat your SIBO in a way that promotes gaining weight and not withering away. Let's get to it. I've drawn us quite the diagram that we'll start with and then we'll go over each of a couple of mechanisms that can be at play and how you can tackle each of them. So first and foremost, this is a kind of hideous but accurate representation of your digestive tract or your digestive tube, if you will. So here we've got your mouth where the food comes in, obviously. We've got the tube that goes down from your mouth, the esophagus. This dilated portion of your digestive tract is the stomach. Then the longest part of this tube is from here to here. That's your small intestine. You can see that this person has a pretty gnarly case of SIBO right up about halfway through the small intestine. And then finally, the last bit, this lumpy part is the colon and the rectum and anus are down below. So we've got an entrance, an exit, and everything in between. And I drew the green to represent the bacterial uh, mass and the microbial mass. So that is bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, archaea and everything in between, um, but that is going to be your microbiome, more or less. The purple cells are going to be a representation of your immune system, and you can see that I've labeled here that about 70% of your entire immune system lives in and around your gut, so it's a pretty big deal, especially if you have an autoimmune condition. And then we'll talk about this momentarily. And then over here, I've just highlighted a couple of organs, a couple of cells, and a blood vessel, and we'll talk about how each of these are involved. So right out the get-go, I'm just going to point out how utterly brilliant SIBO actually is and why it completely makes sense from a microbiological and physiological level and the relevance to you and your SIBO journey. Again, you can see I colored the same green because that's where the mass of the bacteria and the mass of the microbiome is. And if you think about, say, in this, this whole scheme, or think of a person who has no SIBO and they just have bacteria hanging out in their colon. That is a giant wad of bacteria that you're carrying around in your colon, trillions of bacterial cells, and they all have to compete for a finite amount of food and a finite amount of space in the colon. So if you were bacterial cell number nine gajillion and one, if you wanted to have the best life and the best opportunity possible, and you wanted to go see the world and have more food, you would venture closer to the mouth, closer to the entrance of the food. The small intestine has fewer bacteria, uh, closer to the food portion of the digestive tube. Therefore, it makes complete and total sense that slowly but surely the bacteria in your colon might really want to creep closer to that end of the food tube. However, that's obviously not favorable for us. In this regard, when we eat food, so for example, I will just label this N for nutrients, and we'll talk about this pretty broadly, but if you have nutrients coming in, they come in, go through the stomach and the beginning part of digestion. If it's something particularly that's absorbed in the latter part of the small intestine and it's not absorbed pretty immediately, then you're gonna have a hard time because you're gonna be competing with bacteria for your own dang food. So that is the first mechanism by which small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or possibly CFO, fungal overgrowth, can make you lose weight. It's because your bacteria and your microorganisms are literally out competing you for your own food. So that is number one. I'll put a one here, is the bacteria competing. The next thing to know, and I think the most important part of this whole clinical picture, is that of malabsorption and leaky gut. And we'll kind of use leaky gut in a broad term. Um, there's different varieties of leaky gut and there's different varieties of malabsorption and different causes of it, but I'm going to talk more at the intestinal epithelial level and we're gonna talk about it a little bit more broadly for simplicity's sake. But as you can see, I've drawn some of the cells of the lining, so we're zooming in from the gut lining. And we have these epithelial cells in the small intestine in this case. They've got their little villi that are out into the gut lumen and they can absorb nutrients and they can feel and sense the world around them. And normally on a day-to-day -day basis, if you don't have SIBO and you don't have a profound amount of leaky gut or inflammation, your epithelial cells will pick and choose what nutrients go get absorbed through the cells and what ones go in between the cells. And then bada bing, bada boom, 
they will gain access to your bloodstream and then away they go. They're gonna to go to the liver, they're gonna get checked out, make sure it's okay and there's no pathogens and then out to the rest of your bloodstream and you have nutrients and nutrition that will nourish your body. However, in the case of leaky gut or intestinal permeability or malabsorption, Let's say we'll talk about the flavor of leaky gut where entire cells are taken out. You lose intestinal epithelial cells all day, every day. They're sloughed off and normally your body can keep up and repair itself and everybody's hunky-dory. But if your body's not able to keep up with that demand and you have more of a leaky gut than you're able to cope with, that could be problematic. So now this person has leaky gut, they've got gaping holes in their intestine lining, and they have inflammation and all of the fun immune problems that go along with that. Because look, at the proximity between the gut epithelial lining and the basal membrane and the intestinal uh, inf immune cells. Anyhow, marching on. Now here's what's kind of stupid and ironic about this whole situation. When you have leaky gut, the bacteria and bacterial toxins and components of these microorganisms are much easier for you to absorb and they get translocated, they get into the bloodstream and now you have endotoxemia. You have, um, that is specific to endotoxin which is also known as LPS, but you have bacterial metabolites getting through into the bloodstream and away it goes. And we're gonna talk about what happens in just a moment. The other thing that's really infuriating about this whole situation is that you would think that your nutrients, your vitamins, your minerals, your carbohydrates and proteins and fat and the building blocks of your body, you would think that because there's big gaping holes, they would be much easier to absorb, but that's not the case. They get blocked. So what you have is you have an increased amount of stuff coming through the gut in the form of bacterial and yeast, toxins and debris and you have less of the nutrients coming into your body that you actually need. Now, what we haven't talked about yet is over here at the immune system level, the reason why 70% of your immune system is hanging out in and around your gut is because those are your guards. Those are your sentinels. They're hanging out waiting for stuff to get weird. And when it does, they're going to protect you. What they'll do is they will call in the troops and since most of the rest of the troops live in some far off lymph node or a spleen or a bone marrow or some other tissue, they're gonna to have to send out a messenger molecule out into the bloodstream to call the troops from their lymph node or the spleen or whatever tissue they reside in. These are called cytokines. Usually there's more than one involved in whatever inflammatory process you've got going on, but I'll put that in parentheses. The cytokines are inflammatory messenger molecules. And what they typically do is they tell a certain type of immune cell, hey, come over here, follow the gradient where it gets denser and denser, figure out where the signal is coming from and come over here because we need you, we need backup. But what also happens is that they are inherently inflammatory for the most part. There's a couple that are anti-inflammatory, but across the board, the ones that get revved up with SIBO and dysbiosis and leaky gut tend to be very pro-inflammatory. So now you've got this inflammatory soup, as I like to call it, this barrage of cytokines from the immune system because the immune system is seeing, hey, we've got bacteria, we've got a lot of stuff going on and we need help. The other thing is that these immune cells that hang out right under the gut are gonna see what's going on. They're gonna see this leaky gut and this malabsorption and this endotoxemia where these bacterial toxins and yeast toxins are getting through, and these immune cells are going to send out the Mayday SOS, or as the kids might say, OMG, and that's translated into cytokines, and away you go. Now you've got a boatload of inflammation, and you have a malnourished body because you're also not absorbing your nutrients. Now, what is probably not a shocker, but I'm going to mention it anyway, if you're not absorbing your nutrients, if you don't have enough B12 or selenium or protein or fat or building blocks to build your body, you're going to be in a state where you're breaking down more than you're building up. You're going to have a hard time building new muscle and new bone and new 
adipose and skin and hair and everything if you don't have these building blocks. So if you have malnutrition or malabsorption because of this leaky gut inflammatory cascade, it's gonna make it really difficult for you to put on weight and to not wither away. So obviously, this is a pretty big deal. I'll kind of make a little star around it. Also, what we haven't talked about yet, kind of the third leg of this journey is that these inflammatory cytokines muck up your whole body. They don't just tell signals to the immune cells. All of your bodies have receptors for cytokines and they are influenced by cytokines. That's why cytokines can make your joints hurt. They can make your brain foggy and fatigued. They can make your thyroid go wackadoodle. They can make all the cells in your body go wacko and not work appropriately. So here we've got inflammation because your body sees the bacteria and they're like, whoa, that shouldn't be here. You've got inflammation because bacteria and their components are gonna translocate through the leaky gut and your immune system says, whoa, this shouldn't be here, this should not be happening. You've got this inflammatory barrage of cytokines or inflammatory soup, as I like to call it, and you've got that affecting the brain, which may affect your hunger signaling and your satiety, whereas normally you might get hungry more often or your blood sugar might be more stable. If your brain is more inflamed because of cytokines, those things are going to be altered in this situation. If, as an example, to use the thyroid, if you are a person who is more prone to autoimmune Graves' disease, and that happens because of this inflammatory cascade, SIBO could instigate Graves' disease, and that it's the Graves' disease and the excess of thyroid hormone that revs up your metabolism too much and makes you drop a bunch of weight. Or if you're looking at more of like the muscle cells and the adipose cells, these are just supposed to be generic cells, then the metabolism of those cells are gonna be deranged in ways that we don't really have the ability to predict clearly, in my opinion. So there's really three layers, I would say, is that A, you're competing for food with your bacterial mass that makes up your SIBO. That's number one. Number two, and most significantly, I think, is going to be the combination of this leaky gut and the translocation of inflammatory stuff and the malabsorption of your nutrients and your building blocks because of leaky gut. And then number two is the inflammatory cascade, this inflammatory cytokine soup is gonna make it really hard for your end organs to function. So it makes it hard for your brain and your thyroid and your muscle tissue and your adipose tissue and your skin and anything to work appropriately. So those are the big ways that SIBO will make you lose weight. Now, to answer the bigger question, what do you do about it? Well, A, you treat the SIBO, guys. That's the biggest thing you can do, is treat the SIBO. Obviously, if this person were to just start bulking up with protein shakes and not address the overgrowth in and of itself, they're not gonna get anywhere, and it's going to go horribly. So A, you need to treat the actual SIBO, and that should not be a surprise, and I, I have a gazillion videos on this by this point, so watch the SIBO mistake videos, watch some of the videos about leaky gut, about the motility, do what you need to do to treat the SIBO and its root causes and the motility and get that underway. That is the biggest thing you can do. I kind of gave up on the numbering system I just realized. So number one, let's see, number two, number three. I will say this also, I'm gonna put number four up here. This is probably my number two other than number two, which is with SIBO in particular, there's still a very strong group tendency to gravitate towards low FODMAP, SCD, the biphasic diet, some sort of SIBO diet. And it is very, very hard to get enough calories to sustain your day-to-day -day function in life and get out of that breakdown catabolic state if you're on a restricted diet. So if you are doing low FODMAP, if you're doing SCD, if you're doing biphasic, if you're doing any sort of SIBO diet, getting off of that diet, getting off the restricted diet so that you can eat more calories and get more food in your system and get more variety, that's not only going to be tremendously healing to the colonic microbiota and your total inflammatory potential, but it's also gonna open up a lot more food options 
and it's going to be better for your mental health as far as like controlling when you're hungry and when you're not and how you're feeling about food. And this is the kind of stuff too that sometimes I refer people to work with a psychologist who knows what they're doing with food fear and untangling that web. If you're terrified to eat because you have had SIBO for so many years that you can't eat anything without bloating up or getting diarrhea, the restricted diet is part of this cascade and getting off of that diet can be tremendously healing and be the thing that helps you gain weight. So I almost forgot to mention that one. But as far as treating each individual thing, you need to treat the SIBO in and of itself, as I said, and that goes down to treating the dysmotility, you know, things like probiotics and prebiotics, getting off the dang SIBO diets, antimicrobials, but don't go too crazy. That's all pretty standard stuff by this point on my channel. If you have an immune system that is more prone to autoimmunity, or if you have a diagnosed autoimmune condition, or if you know for whatever reason that you have a lot of this cytokine inflammatory soup going on, then paying a little bit of attention to that and doing things like turmeric and green tea and resveratrol and fish oil and vitamin D, that could be really helpful for untangling all of this mess. Because then, what I didn't draw yet, is that these cytokines also go down to the gut and make it more leaky. So it is a self-perpetuating cycle. Leaky gut will crank up these cytokines and then cytokines and deficiencies will keep the gut leaky so that it won't heal. So treating it can be a very holistic thing to do. Uh, if you have leaky gut, the best way to know that is to test. Honestly, I order the test a lot on my patients. It's a very cheap test to do. The lactulose mannitol test from Genova is like 50 bucks for a coinsurance. It's max out of pocket is like $100, I think. It's a very reasonable test to do and it gives you a lot of insight. There are other tests like blood tests and stool tests that I don't find to be as accurate, but actually assessing whether or not you have leaky gut and understanding how big of an issue that is for you can be really helpful. But if you don't heal this gut and you don't heal the lining and the permeability, then you're gonna be missing out on the biggest piece of your weight loss SIBO journey. And then lastly, coming back over here to the end organs, there are other examples that we could talk about. Again, thyroid, more than likely the way that that would be involved in this would be something like Graves' disease. Another one is that a lot of times SIBO in and of itself will cause pancreatitis or pancreatic insufficiency. Gosh, that is not what a pancreas looks like at all. I tried to draw a tail. Whatever, you'll have to settle for my artwork. Um, but if you have pancreatic insufficiency or pancreatitis and your inability to digest is coming from the pancreas being involved because of the inflammatory cytokines and the leaky gut and the microbes and all of this jazz, then taking something like a digestive enzyme and working on that component of it can also be helpful. But as you can see, this is a whole big web. This is the kind of stuff that goes on in my brain when I'm treating my SIBO patients because no two SIBO patients are alike. And this is why I get these comments on my YouTube channel every couple of weeks. I get somebody asking, what is your protocol for methane SIBO? What is your protocol for hydrogen SIBO? I don't have one because you're all unique snowflakes. You're all so different. It's not practical to have actual protocols in place, but there are things that we can think about clinically and there are things in the picture and the grand scheme of things that we can weigh and we can decide, okay, for this individual, most of the work is gonna be done here and we also need to think about this. For another individual, most of the work is here, but we also need to think about this. And then we can move on and we can make informed clinical choices. But there will never be a SIBO protocol, quote unquote, not in my opinion, because you're all too unique, you're too individual, and it's just not practical. But anyway, I could go on about that. That's another video that I'll save for another day, but I really hope that this video helped you. If you guys like the video, go ahead and give it a like and subscribe to my channel and leave me a comment. I would love to know what questions and what kind of things you have in mind and what videos you would like to see. And I'd be happy to make some and do a shout out when I make those videos for that matter. Um, but like I said, actually liking the video and commenting and subscribing to the channel actually helps me a lot and helps the channel. And the more subscribers I get, the more I build up this channel, the more time I can dedicate to making SIBO videos and making YouTube videos for you. So any support is appreciated. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next video.